Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Hopefully you guys are doing well this evening. It is hot as crap out here in California right now. Uh, we've got like a little heat wave coming through with some monsoonal moisture, uh, thunder clouds. It's not, we're not getting thunder showers in my area. Um, in some of the surrounding deserts around me, we've been getting thunder showers. I think I posted something on social media last week where I was driving from one of the desert areas I was working in and, and there was a thunder shower and I pulled over and watched it. But with that monsoonal moisture comes uh, humidity and uh, we've been, it's pretty humid for us. Now, we don't really know what humidity is here in California. So those of you in the Midwest and the East Coast are going to laugh when I tell you the humidity right now. And I'll tell you, I'm going to pull up my thermostat. So it says that <clears throat> uh, 35% humidity outside and uh, it's just swampy. It's nasty. So 35% humidity. And actually today's a cooler day. It's 96 degrees outside. Last week we were like 110. It was nuts. But this week uh, started off a little rough for me uh, just because I went away this weekend. It was my anniversary. So my wife and my kids, we went to one of the little uh, mountain resorts local to us, Lake Arrowhead for those locals and uh, spent the weekend up there. And I felt out of touch because I hadn't been away you know, I basically shut my phone off for two or three days. Um, Connor, thank you very much for that super chat. That's really awesome, bud. Um, I really appreciate that. So, uh, yeah, I, it's been a while since I've actually taken any time off. And <laughs> my time off is, is I took Friday off and I didn't answer my phone Saturday and Sunday. So that's taking time off for me. But I felt completely out of touch. So I came back to work today and uh, I was just kind of like, I didn't know what to do. I was lost because there was service calls that happened, stuff that I couldn't keep track of. Hey, Randy, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. You guys are awesome with these super chats. Thank you very much, okay? Um, but yeah, I just I was so out of sorts today. I just didn't know what to do. I was just kind of like trying to catch up, and uh, I did two service calls today. Uh, one of them was uh, ice machine repair that took most of my day. Um, but I'm still trying to catch up. 
it's really weird when you're so attached to work and you take a day off, it just messes your head up. At least that's how I work. I'm, I know I'm weird and stuff. So, but Hey, thanks for showing up guys. I really appreciate y'all in here. Do me a favor. Give the, uh, the stream a thumbs up. Uh, if you're on mobile, just X out of the chat, hit the thumbs up button. If you're on a computer, it's easy. If you're on a TV, eh, I get it. It's a little bit more difficult to do it. I can do it on my Roku on my TV, but it's just kind of a pain. So I get it. It's all good. Um, as usual, I got a list of things I want to talk about. And then also I want to address the chat. You guys got questions and different things. Make sure you post them in caps lock and I'll try to get to them. Okay. Um, I am definitely behind on comments. Uh, so over the weekend, obviously I've just had a hard time keeping up with all the comments. So, um, I don't have a lot of questions from the comments today just because I didn't get an opportunity to really go through them. I also got off work a little bit late later than I'd like to essentially, but I still got a bunch of emails and things that I want to cover. So, um, yeah, Sean, you did. Sean actually ran into me in uh, Lake Arrowhead village. That's right. So we were walking through his family and my family and we crossed paths and Sean stopped me and said, Hey, so that was really cool. It's neat to see people, you know, uh, out and, and, and people like come up and recognize me. It's, it's a little weird because I'm not used to that, but it is cool to see people and to actually see someone besides just a screen name, you know, that's chatting in a live chat or something like that. So it's really neat. It's really cool. So if you guys ever do see me out in the wild, make sure you stop me and say, Hey, especially if I'm in a supply house, because oftentimes it's okay. You can stop me. I have like a one track mind. And so sometimes I like go into the supply house with like something on my mind and I just go straight to the counter and start getting what I need. Um, I don't mind if people stop me and say, Hey, uh, I got no problem with that. Uh, again, you just got to stop me and say, Hey dude, what's up? You know? And it, sometimes I just don't pay attention to my surroundings when I'm walking in and things. So, um, but I also do have asshole written on my forehead. So I know a lot of people think like, Hey, I don't want to bother him or something, but go ahead. It's all good. That's just my, my personality. Um, so, uh, Jessica, thank you very much for wearing that. I really appreciate that. For those of you that um, have already supported the channel, you do not have to do this. I'm going to address this right now. Jessica had said something, okay? Um, I really, really appreciate those of you that have purchased uh, hats and shirts from me. It's it's so humbling to, to have you guys do that. That's been really cool. Um, so, uh, you know, just thank you guys so very much. I also want to start this off right now. I don't know which ones of you did this, okay, but I have to say thank you so very much, okay? I'm sure there was a few of you that did it because I'm sure it wasn't just one person that got me nominated, okay? Um, but I was, uh, what, I don't know how you say this. Um, I made the top 40 under 40 list for the HVACR news, and basically it's the top 40 under 40 years old. Uh, HVAC service techs, you know, changing things in the industry and stuff like that. They do this list every single year. I've actually known about it for a while, but they just released it today. So I want to say thank you so very much. They just announced the winners or the whatever. I don't know what you call those people, but anyways, it's for the HVACR News Magazine. Um, but again, thank you to those of you that nominated me. Again, I don't know who you are, but I really, really appreciate it. It was really kind of cool. Um, it was a little awkward having to write like a bio for an editor, it was it was a little weird, but again, uh, thank you. I, I'm I'm honored to be nominated for that. That was really cool, um, and it was cool that I actually made the the list or whatever. So, thank you guys so very much. Okay, um, let me see what we got going on in the chat. Glass half full. Thank you very much for that super chat, bud. Um, I drank way too much this weekend, so for today it is carbonated water from Costco, lemon flavor. So uh, yeah. Um, Bloody Marys all weekend, and uh, it was a nice time. So the really cool thing where we went. Uh, Sean Michael, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. That is awesome, but you don't have to do that, but thank you very much. Um, so where we went, we were staying at Lake Arrowhead Resort, and uh, it's a bit pricey, you know, but it was really cool because, like, everything was there. We could walk to the village. They had restaurants in there. So it was really nice not having to drive anywhere once we got there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Something in my throat. But it was a nice little getaway with the family, so it was really cool, and it was it was needed, much needed, so... All right, let's see what else we got going on in here. Um, let me see. Uh, Joshua Keaton, thank you very much. Keating, thank you very much for that super chat. Um, he's asking if I am union, and if not, have I considered doing so? And if not, maybe why? You're union yourself, but you love... Okay, so yeah, here's the thing. Uh, I am not union. I live in Southern California. Southern California is not a union-strong state. There is a union presence, but it is not 
strong. Okay. Um, I run my own business, uh, and I have a hard enough time <laughs> finding employees. Uh, it's not really something that I would consider going union with my company, but in general, um, I have no problems with unions. Okay. It's just, um, it, it wouldn't be economical, uh, in the restaurant refrigeration side of the business that I deal with to be a union company, because basically our prices would be so high that we would price ourselves out of the market. Um, but again, I have absolutely no problem with unions. Uh, I, I do think that they serve a purpose in certain places. Um, I, I also understand that, you know, certain particular unions, not saying HVAC, but you know, some of them can be problematic, but again, I understand the concept and, uh, more power to you. If you are union, I will say that especially in the past, and I know they still really do a good job today. Uh, the training coming from the unions were awesome. Okay. And is awesome. I actually have a buddy that went union recently. Um, my buddy, Rudy, and, uh, I think about two years ago, he went in union and he loves it. Uh, every time I ask him, he says it's absolutely great for him and good for him. You know, that, that is awesome. He loves, uh, the company that he works for, but, um, I absolutely support unions. I, I'm not partial either way. Um, it's just not, uh, something that's strong in my area and dealing with restaurants, I would not be able to stay competitive, um, with that. But, uh, yeah, again, nothing against them. So, um, thank you very much for that super chat coming through. All right. And, uh, let's see what else we got going on in here. Um, yeah, uh, Sean, it would be really interesting to see more ammonia, uh, on YouTube. Uh, my buddy, U uh, Ulysses Palacios, I believe that's how he pronounces his name. Uh, does work on some ammonia stuff. And every once in a while, he'll put some clips on Instagram or Facebook or something like that. He doesn't really put them on YouTube very much anymore. Um, he did have a channel. He still has a channel, but um, there's not really anybody else besides Ulysses, I think, that I've se ever seen any ammonia footage whatsoever. So, you know, we're always looking for more. Uh, we need more people in the industry to try to help and share their knowledge for sure, because... Um, this trade needs help all together, all the way around. Um, we need more. So definitely anybody that gets an opportunity and can do so their company's cool with it. I, I highly suggest that they consider, uh, doing stuff on YouTube because it will definitely, um, uh, help the trade for sure. So, all right, I'm going to put this over here. Let me rearrange my screens here real quick so I can accurately see my list of things to talk about. I kind of, again, I'm a little bit messed up in the head right now because I'm not quite, there we go. That's much better. So everything is back where it's supposed to be. Um, let me see any advice on applying for my, f or for your first HVACR job. So, you know, uh, for the young people in the trade that want to get into HVAC, I think it's great. Um, applying for your first job, you need to understand something, especially if you're coming out of trade school, uh, just because the trade school, because I'm not saying everyone does this, but a lot of trade schools out there feed all kinds of information down your throat saying that you're worth this much money and all this different stuff and you are going to be making this much and $20, $30 an hour and da-da-da-da-da. That's not how it works when you get out there, okay? Just because you went to a trade school and you you have some book knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to hit the ground running and be making $35 an hour you know, starting off. So um, be humble. That's the best thing I can tell you. Remember something, that when you're applying for a service company, you're interviewing them just as much as they are interviewing you, okay? Now, don't be rude about it, don't be a jerk, but at the same time, you need to ask questions that will help you feel more comfortable with the company too. If it's possible, this is getting harder and harder these days, if it's possible, I highly suggest that you uh, ask them to let you do a ride-along with one or two of their service technicians or maybe even the owner, okay? And kind of get a feel for the kind of work that they do and how they operate. You know, kind of pay attention to how they handle dispatching, how does the office staff interact with the technicians, that kind of stuff, okay? Because again, remember, you are interviewing them just as much as they are interviewing you, okay? Uh, you know, you're about to make a big decision. Now, me personally, I'm not a person that jumps ship, well, I've never jumped ship, but I mean, I'm not a fan of people jumping ship left and right for 50 cents here, 50 cents there, that kind of stuff. I think that people should give things more time, but also that people should um, be more uh, thorough about the companies that they go to work for. Okay. Um, I have no 
sympathy for a technician that tells me, you know what, I've worked for a company for 15 years and they've treated me like crap all 15 years, it's time to leave. Well, that's not the company's fault, that's your fault for being there for 15 years, okay? You need to know when to leave, but also you wanna be careful about leaving just for a, a 25 cent raise, okay? Um, you want to, when you're working for a service company, and I feel like I might be contradicting myself here, but when you're working for a service company, you also want to address issues when they happen, okay? Even if they seem petty, you wanna bring them up to your supervisor and say, hey, you know what? I really didn't like the way that we interacted on this and just make it known. Just remember, it's a difficult thing for me as a business owner too to have to deal with in personnel files and writing people up and different things like that. But on the flip side, as a service technician, you also need to note things and issues that you have with your service company often, okay? Just like a company is gonna do a simple write-up if there's a mistake that was made by you and you know there was an issue, they're gonna do a write-up. It doesn't mean you're gonna get fired. It just goes in your personnel file. At the same time, you as a service technician need to hold the company accountable too when things happen. Like, hey, you know what? That wasn't really cool the way that that happened or, you know, uh, I wasn't on call, but I had to fill in. Like, you know, I'm not saying that, um, you know, you need to be a jerk about it, but just remember that as a service technician, you know, you or as an uh, apprentice or someone that wants to go into HVACR, you need to interview the company just as much as they're interviewing you. I don't know how many times I can say that, but apparently I must have said it about four or five times now. So hopefully that makes sense to you, bud. Uh, if I didn't answer your question completely, send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com, and I'll try to get to it a little bit more, okay? Um, let me see what else we got in here. Uh, would I let my guys record and post videos on YouTube if they wanted to? No, I actually would not. Uh, that's a really simple, easy answer. So I actually wrote that in our employee handbook that no, my service technicians are not allowed to record and post videos on social media and or YouTube. Um, it's a fine line what I post in my videos. And uh, recently, uh, this is it was actually kind of a scary thing. Terry, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate that. So very recently, I had one of my restaurant chains contact me. And it was the facilities director. And he said, hey, bud, so we had a video come across our desk at one of our restaurants and it was you and they wanted to know what the deal was. And I about crapped my pants because you can only, well, you, there's certain businesses that would never approve you to post videos on YouTube. Let's just say that. Okay. Because there are giant corporations and lawyers are involved and there's nobody that's ever going to give you permission because it's a liability nightmare. Okay. So, uh, said person contacted me, said, Hey, you know what? We saw that you had a video and I was starting to get scared. And I said, yes, that was me. And yes, I do make videos. I make them as a training aid for my employees and I share them with the public. And then his next response was, we really like them. And we really appreciate the fact that you don't show the restaurant names in your videos, nor do you show you talk crap about the restaurants. So would I let my employees film? No, because it takes a lot of work. I know exactly how much work it takes to keep the restaurants anonymous, to go through the comments and delete any restaurant names, right or wrong, when people are trying to guess. It takes a lot of work, and it's a liability nightmare. Um, and no, unfortunately, I would not let my employees film. I, that is a rule that we have. Uh, it seems strange, but that's just how it is. So um, let me see what else we got in here. What am I missing? Um, all right. Uh, okay. So, uh, when it comes to thermostats and regions, most thermostats are dial from one to nine. What exactly do the numbers mean? The numbers don't really mean anything. If you don't understand the difference or the differential, or no, I wouldn't even say the differential, um, you know, each thermostat is going to, well, yeah, the differential would be correct. Yeah. Each thermostat is going to have um, a different range. That's the word I'm looking for. So one to nine doesn't mean anything for me. What you need to do is, uh, let's just say you're using a Ronco, uh, I think, oh gosh, an old Ronco A30-261. That was a, uh, air sensing cold control. If I remember right. Wow. It's been a long time. Um, so on that one, it was a one to nine reading. And what you would need to do is you would need to look at the range on the box. It would say range from 26 degrees to, you know, 44 degrees. So then what you would do is you would take that 26 to 44 and you would divide it by the amount of numbers on the dial. And that would tell you 
the, the, the difference between each number. So again, it really depends on each manufacturer and the range that they have. Now, some manufacturers have an actual thermostat that has uh, temperature numbers on it, and that definitely helps more. Um, when you get into those old uh, mechanical thermostats, um, you know, the cold controls, they were a little bit more difficult to set because you had to figure out what the range was and, you know, you kind of got used to where to set them. So, all right. Um, let me go ahead and get to my list of things to talk about right here. Uh, Bill Burnett, what's my new favorite tool? I've really, really been liking the, the FLIR 1 Pro thermal imager. I've been using that a little bit more, um, finding new uses for it. So I have been liking that a lot. Um, let me see what else we got. Okay, so uh, the last two videos that I had this last week um, was on 820. I had water leaking from the bar AC, and that was basically a cleaning video, okay? I got a lot of feedback from that video, negative feedback, and uh, I do want to address that, okay? So uh, that video, I had a service call on a water leak from a bar AC, and when I went out there, it was actually recorded all the way back in June, okay? And when I went out there, uh, I already kind of had an idea. I think I said in the very beginning of the video, we were just coming out of the first lockdown, and I knew everything was going to be dirty. So, yes, of course, everything was dirty. We had multiple ACs. I didn't show the entire building cleaning, but we ended up going through a lot of those ACs. But on the video, I showed the one bar AC, trying to figure out which bar AC it was. And then I found a water leak, and then I went ahead and cleaned the coils, and uh, I was using refrigeration technologies cleaners and I got so much feedback, negative feedback saying, you know, I sold out and all this different stuff. And how come I'm, t you know, it sounded like an infomercial. It sounded like a commercial, all this different stuff. You know what? Go pound sand. <laughs> really? I mean, seriously, you don't have to watch if you have problems with my videos. OK, it it's as simple as that. Um, those of you that support my channel, I know. Um, there's several of you that still like the stuff. I don't do that crap all the time, but there was a few people that were really harping on the whole negative side of that. And you know what? It's cool. Just don't watch anymore. If you have a problem with my videos, it's that simple. Okay. Um, I have said this from the very beginning that I beat to the tune of my own drum. I don't answer to anybody on my videos. Nobody makes me do anything. Okay. I promote people's products all the time. Uh, I do have two partners that I work with right now. I've been very public about those two partners. Obviously, Sporlin has been a partner for well over a year now. And Refrigeration Technologies is another partner. Um, the arrangement that I have with Refrigeration Technologies, they don't ask me to do anything. They just say, hey, you know what? We want to be partnered with you. Uh, promote us when you can. Okay, so I chose to make those. They didn't make me do that stuff. Um, I use their products and have promoted their products well before I started working with them. It's as simple as that. OK, I promote other people's products all the time. Like I bet you a million people think that I'm sponsored or have a partnership with Field Peace. I don't. OK, I've done some projects with Field Peace, but I don't have a, a partnership, but I promote their products all the time because I believe in them. I like their products. OK, I like to tell you guys the things that I like. And if I find something useful, I like to use it and show it in a video. And it's as simple as that. And I don't mean to offend if I offend. So, you know, some people then so be it. OK, but. It is what it is. Uh, Terry, thank you very much uh, for that super chat, man. That is awesome. You said you made your very first bubble factory today. Yeah, it's really easy to make a bubble factory when you're using uh, some of the cleaners. Um, you know, you got to make sure on the micro channels that you want to really blow those things or tap them out because the water really gets trapped in there and it just makes a bubble fest. I've shown it a few times in the videos. I've never had it end in a problem, but I've always been worried about it shorting out a motor or something like that. So um, let's see what else. Uh, Exactly. Jeremy, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, Gavin Newsom. Uh, you know what, Stephen? I, I, you are absolutely correct that Gavin Newsom does make me do some certain things. You are absolutely right. That is a whole nother topic. I need to go on someone's other thing. So, um, yeah, and, and that, that's the thing that I really do like about the, the Viper products is um, I like... Uh, the fact that they're safe, okay? And they don't burn your hands off, right? I literally had a service technician many years ago that was cleaning condenser coils and he took some of the blue cleaner, not from refrigeration technologies. I'm not gonna throw the people under the bus because it is what it is, but he, uh, he got some of that cleaner on his boot and his boot had a hole in it and it got in his sock now, granted, this wasn't the other company's problem, but the dude went on working the entire day without changing his sock with coil cleaner in his boot. He ended up wearing a hole in his foot 
and had an infection and it got into this big old giant thing. It was like a nightmare. Okay. The thing I like about refrigeration technologies is their, their, their stuff is safe. Okay. Um, so you, you know, you, you still got to use it responsibly, but it's safe stuff. All right. All right. Um, the next video that I had was an emergency walk-in freezer call that was on 823 walk-in freezer with a bad condenser fan motor. So in that video, uh, Scott, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Scott, for promoting my merch. I really appreciate it. So yes, hats are back in stock, guys. I probably still have about 50 in stock right now. So uh, scoop them up while you can because uh, they go pretty fast. So um, really appreciate that. Oh, and guys, um, I think I said this on the last one. I am going back and forth with a guy that does my my merch, my hats and all that stuff. And we are working on beanies for the winter time. So we're starting the process right now. It's going to be a lengthy process. I think I said this last time because I just uh, he, he, he did some artwork for me and I just approved the artwork. And then uh, he's going to get me samples made of the different artwork designs. I, there's three designs that I potentially will go with um, of different styles of beanies. So if everything goes good, I'll have samples in a couple weeks. And then hopefully it'll be another couple weeks after that when they got to order them and make them and all that fancy stuff. So, um, but you know, I don't, I don't just order any crap. I like, you know, like with these hats, when I did these hats, I literally wore this hat for a year before I even released them because I wanted to make sure it worked out really good. Now the beanies, I'm not going to wear for a year, but I am going to order them, make sure that they're good, check out the quality before I release them or anything like that. So keep, you know, that that'll be a month or two from now, but we'll have those soon. Okay. All right, let's see what else. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 definitely, Ryan. I'll get to that right now. So let me hit this last thing, Ryan. Don't let me forget that question, okay? So um, on the emergency walk-in freezer call that I had, uh, I walked up onto the roof and walk-in freezer was down. I was already a little agitated because it was an end-of-the-day service call, okay? Um, but once I got there, you know, it kind of set my agitation off even more because we had dirty condensers, bad condenser fan motor, bad condenser fan motor on the walk-in cooler, three exhaust fans not working. It was just like, ugh, you know, one of those, I think it was even a Friday. I think it might've been, but it was just one of those. No, it wasn't a Friday. I think it was a, a Wednesday or something, but it was just one of those days where it was hot, you were tired. And then this happened, you know, guys, I'm human. All right. I got some, some feedback in there too. And I got to let you guys know. I'm not some person that just doesn't feel emotions, doesn't feel anything, okay? I get frustrated after a long day and it's really hot and I'm exhausted and I just wanna go home and you get that emergency service call, I get pissed off, I'm real, okay? It happens, I'm not gonna hide that and say that I'm this perfect person that never gets angry, I get angry, okay? But um, I don't direct that anger towards the customer, I try as hard as I can to make sure that they don't see my frustration. But yeah, I'll call a friend or reach out to some buddies or call my wife or something and just be like, you know, seriously, this is a call. But at the end of the day, I am thankful that the customer is calling me. Okay. So yes, I do get frustrated, but they could call someone else. It's really easy for them to call someone else. It's simple. They just pick up the phone and call some other company. And then I don't get that work anymore. Okay. So I have to know when to bite the bullet, swallow my pride and just go out there and do the service call in that situation. That's what I did. Okay. Now I, I did what I could to get them going, even though I was frustrated, even though I was hot, I walked up there and I had a bad condenser fan motor blade and bracket that I didn't have. Okay. I, I certainly could have opened a supply house, but I was like, why? Why open the supply house when I could literally just hose off that condenser for the night, put a mister on it and get them through the night, save the supply house a headache, you know, save myself some time, get home a little bit sooner. Okay. So that's what I did. All right. I got the system operational, then went back and did a full repair on it. Cleaning, clean the walk-in cooler next to it, got the exhaust fans repaired and the customer was happy and thankful that we did all of that. Okay. So there is that fine line of, you know, yes, I get angry at times, but then also knowing when, you know, hey, don't show the customer this anger. You know what? It is what it is. You know, you're never in, in and I've, I've gone down this path before, but you're never going to convince the customer, you know, that they're wrong. You're not. I mean, what 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 good would come from showing the customer anger? What good is going to come from that? I mean, even if it's like blatant, ridiculous stuff, like what good is going to come from that? None. OK, yeah. You know, when you cool down, it'd be, I think it'd be a good idea if you really, really find the need to have to discuss something with the customer. When things cool down a week later, go have a conversation with them and say, hey, you know, what? that was really kind of a bummer. 
you know, I think this could have been a little bit better. It could have saved you a lot of money if we would have, you know, you would have done maintenances or, or whatever. Okay. Um, in these times though, right now, ain't no chain restaurants doing maintenances on a regular basis. Okay. We have some that are still doing some, but it's not as thorough as it used to be. Okay. Everybody's pinching pennies right now. Um, so it is what it is. And the way that I look at it is I just got to be thankful for the little bit that I do get. So, um, all right. Uh, Ryan had asked me about, Oh shoot. I lost your comment right now, Ryan. Where did it go? Okay. Um, Ryan, Ryan's comment was asking about fixing a leak on a discharge line. So he says, can I chat about fixing a cracks discharge line and a potential running a compressor with low oil? Um, I don't know if you're asking Ryan about a video because I have some videos where I've done that before. And I also have a video. Actually, I didn't even release it, but I went, I posted it on Instagram where I have a cracked discharge line going into a reversing valve com coming directly out of a seven and a half ton scroll compressor. Um, so as far as uh, your question, you said running a compressor with low oil. So running a compressor for an extended period of time with low oil is a major, major problem. Okay. And more than likely you're going to have damage inside of it. Now, my, my thing with cracked discharge lines is, is discharge lines, for the most part, they don't crack for no reason, okay? In my experience, majority of the time, a cracked discharge line is, causing by, is caused by a problem within the compressor, okay? Um, now, if it's, if it's a, a, an oil leak, you know, if you've got a lot of oil around it, in my experience, depending on the compressor, you know, if it's a scroll that you, it doesn't have a sight glass or anything like that, you know, you, you kind of really need to warn the customer and talk to them like, hey, there's a really good chance there's going to be compressor damage. And, you know, I can repair this leak and we can get you running. But for how long? I don't know. You know, I would strongly suggest that they consider replacing the compressor. But also, depending on the cost of the compressor, that may not be something that they want to do. OK, but again, going back to my thing, when discharge lines crack, they usually don't crack for no reason. So in my situation that I just posted on Instagram the other day was I have a reversing valve that is about 24 inches away from the compressor. Uh, the discharge line comes up from the compressor, 90s into the reversing valve, and it's cracked on the body of the reversing valve. So it's not at the joint. It's not at the 90. It's literally the body of the reversing valve where it goes into the valve. And I'm sitting here thinking, why the heck would it crack right there? So I'm very hesitant, but in that situation, that is a seven and a half ton scroll compressor. All right. It's a three phase, seven and a half ton scroll compressor. It's a carrier unit. It's going to be really expensive. So what I'm going to do in my situation is, is I'm going to give the customer the option. I'm going to say, look, there's a, I'd say a 90% chance there's going to be compressor damage, but there's no way of knowing until we fix this leak. Now, in my situation, the compressor is completely out of gas. That's how big the leak is. I put in like, uh, I grab my refrigerant cylinder uh, to put a chaser in it before I put nitrogen in it. I put about two pounds of refrigerant into this 15 ton system and it was just pissing out of the reversing valve. Like I was like, okay, there's not even any point. So I can't even run it. Um, so in my situation, I'm going to give some serious disclaimers. Okay. But if you have a system that's been running on low oil for a very long time, there's a very good chance that there's compressor damage. Um, and, or where did that oil go? Is it, is it all at that crack right there or is it stuck in the condenser? I mean, oh man, what a headache. Oil, oil loss is always a nightmare when it comes to that stuff. So, um, have I ever warmed my lunch on my dashboard? Kenji? Yes, I have. I actually have, um, I have a video on it. I have a hot logic mini hot logic mini is this little portable device that you plug into a cigarette lighter or you plug into a 120 volt outlet if you have an inverter in your van and it actually warms up your lunch. I've actually cooked chicken in my Hot Logic Mini. So basically, um, cause I had an inverter that runs the entire time. So, and it draws real low current. So I plugged that thing in, I put raw chicken in there with like spinach and stuff like that and actually cooked it while I was working. So by the time it came to lunch, it's like a slow cook. You know, it's kind of like a crock pot, but it's tiny, but it's called a hot logic mini. But other than that, yes, I mean, I know you're joking about that, but yes, I have warmed my lunch on my, my dash before, you know, if you've got a burrito or something like that, set it out in the sun. Um, we actually, uh, on, on another note, we, until we learned that this was bad, my poor daughter, my oldest daughter, that's 14, uh, when she was a baby, we used to, uh, cause she was, uh, formula. She, she didn't drink breast milk. So, um, when she was, a, she couldn't, it was a long story, but uh, she was on a special kind of formula and, uh, we used to have to give her bottles. Right. And so we would take those water bottles and we would set them on the dash 
and then let them get hot on the dash through the glass and through the plastic and all that stuff. And then it would be warm enough to make a bottle for her. Um, but then we realized like, oh yeah, that's got like BPA and all that crap in it. And it's actually not good to put hot water bottles and uh, it's bad chemicals and crap from the sun and all that stuff. So my poor daughter, it's going to be my fault. But anyways, going off on a tangent there. Um, so I'm going to get to my questions here. So Mr. Mechanical had asked me about 448A and he's asking if I have been using it often and also how about R32. So I think Mr. Mechanical said he was on the East Coast somewhere and he said that they're really starting to see a lot of 448A. So here in Southern California, for those of you that don't know, we actually beat to the tune of our own drum here, right? Um, we have all kinds of crazy political views that our government has here. And we actually banned 404A as a new installation and or um, basically we banned it on uh, major system retrofits and new installations for walk-in coolers, walk-in freezers a year, I almost think a year and a half ago. So we have been f having to find alternative sources. So my choice in refrigerants for medium temp and low temp has been R448A. So I've been using it for about a year and a half now. Um, not really had any issues. I will say that 448A runs higher discharge line temperatures. Uh, so that is something you have to worry about a little bit. Um, but other than that, that's pretty much it. Uh, no real issues. It is a high glide refrigerant, but I haven't had a single issue really that I'd say is, is the refrigerant's fault. Everything's fine. It's just another refrigerant. I understand the pressure temperature chart, and it's as simple as that. As far as R32, no, I have not come across R32. I know that if you're using like Daikin systems on their mini splits and stuff like that, I believe they use R32. Uh, I don't. I've used R290 a lot in the refrigeration side. We use that. Uh, at least one of my service techs is working on an R290 system two to three times a week. So we work on that stuff all the time. Um, I'm not afraid of R32. Um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Scott HVAC tech. Thank you very much for becoming a channel supporter. That is awesome, bud. I really, really appreciate it. Okay. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Do I work on a negative 80 degree freezer? No, I've never worked on something that cold. So, uh, let's see what else we got going on in here. Uh, Hey, everybody in the chat, it was Adam's birthday over the weekend. So make sure you wish him a happy birthday. So, uh, a team Adam right there. Happy birthday, bud. Happy belated birthday. Um, all right, let's see what else we got. Dale asks about PM. Uh, let me see. I'm, I sometimes have some comments on my, my list of stuff to talk about here. So, um, oh, this is a great question that Dale had emailed me on. Okay. So Dale had emailed me saying, hey, you know what? He was kind of curious about preventative maintenances. So in his situation, what's happening is, is his company um, has, the way he wrote his emails, they're not getting mad at him, but he can tell that they're getting frustrated at how much time he spends on his preventative maintenances. Okay. So according to his email, they give him a checklist of things that they want him to go through. And basically he's saying that in order for him to get through that list properly, it's been taking him a lot more time than they want him to take. And he's kind of curious about how I would deal with that, what I feel about that. Um, and that's a great question. Okay. So when it comes to me, right? I have a, a preventative maintenance checklist that I go through. Okay. But I realize that to fully go through that preventative maintenance checklist, the customer typically doesn't want to pay for it. Each particular maintenance program that I set up, um, the customer has different expectations. Um, they basically come to me and say, Hey, you know what? We want you to do all this work. And I look at it and I say, okay, to do all this work correctly is going to take me eight hours you know, eight hours a month to do at every store. And they're like, no, we don't want to pay that. We only want to pay five hours a month. Okay. Or five hours every quarter or whatever. So, you know, we have a list of things and we go to them and we say, okay, we're not gonna be able to do this, this, this. And we go off that checklist and then we work our way down and we say, okay, we're going to give you six hours of labor, or five hours of labor every quarter. And we're going to do our best to get through that list. Okay. But sometimes the things are really dirty. We're not going to get there. We are completely open with our customer. Um, now, some some companies out there, they want you to be more of a sales service technician. I don't know if that's his case or not. Um, in that situation, what I would suggest is for you to go to your boss and just say, look, uh, there's no way I can get through this list, okay? So you tell me, and this is what you need to ask him, you tell me to your boss, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to stop doing this? Is there a better, maybe, maybe, um, maybe you don't know 
how to do something properly. Maybe your boss can help you. So in this situation, I think communication is the best thing. Just communicate with your boss and say, look, how am I supposed to get through this list? Because the only way that I know how to do this is to take this much time. And, you know, get your boss to say, okay, well, you know what? We actually don't want you to go through this list. Okay. We want you to do this or do that. Adam, thank you very much for that super chat. There's also, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. D W S Y N E. Uh, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really appreciate this. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yep. All the money I spent on my carbonated water. Yep. That's a lot. Adam, thank you very much for that super chat, bud. You know, you don't need to do that stuff. Or is that your way of paying me for the overtime show, Em? I see what you're doing there. You're paying me because you don't want to pay the other guys. So this is your secret way, Adam, of paying me for the overtime show because I'm your favorite on the overtime show, right? And you don't want to pay Joe and you don't want to pay Bill. So you just give me super chats. Got it, Adam. I see where you're going with that one, bud. You're the man. Me and you, we think alike, okay? Just keep it coming. All right. Um, all right. <laughs> Oh man, that's funny. Okay. Uh, hopefully I answered your question on that one, bud. Um, I don't think that you're being a bad technician for wanting to be thorough, but, uh, I definitely think you need to communicate with your boss a little bit better and get what his expectations are because some customers, they don't want to pay for that much stuff. Okay. Some do. Um, it's hard on a residential side because, uh, preventative maintenance agreements on the residential side, when you go in there for $39.99, that's not a PM. You're not there to do all that crap, okay? For a $39.99 PM, all you're there to do is sell them something. I mean, for the most part on the residential side. So um, let me see uh, what I'm missing in here. Oh, Jessica, Clive is the overtime favorite. Dang it, man. Dang it, dang it, dang it. Wow, Jessica. Wow. I see how it is. All right. Um, this was a great question, and we're going to start getting into this a lot more in a little while, guys, uh, as as the season approaches, okay? But uh, Brett had asked me about setting the winter charge, okay? So the winter charge is, or the flooded charge, is what we use on a refrigeration system that has a head pressure control valve. There's a couple different types of head pressure control valves, and essentially it's a low ambient control. The original purpose of a head pressure control valve or a low ambient control is to maintain a pressure differential across the expansion valve, okay? Uh, because the expansion valve doesn't feed correctly if it doesn't have enough pressure pushing the refrigerant through the valve at a certain rate, okay? So when it gets really cold outside, your head pressure drops significantly, your condensing temp drops significantly, therefore you don't have that big amount of pressure pushing the refrigerant through that valve anymore at the rate that it needs to so the valve can operate properly. This was really, really, important on older expansion valves. Now that we have more uh, efficient expansion valves, it's not as critical, okay? Especially now that we have electronic expansion valves, that it's totally not as critical anymore, but we still have a need for head pressure control, okay? So with that being said, when you have a head pressure control valve, you have to have a certain amount of refrigerant in the system, the flooded charge, because what happens is when that head pressure control valve bypasses, what it actually does is it backs the refrigerant up into the condenser, um, this is really hard to picture, but it floods the condenser with refrigerant, leaves a very small passage of space for the vapor to still run through, okay? Um, and it drives the system condensing temperature and head pressure up. Now, in order to properly do that, you have to have the winter charge or the flooded charge, the extra refrigerant just sitting in the system waiting. That refrigerant sits in the system all year long. So when the summertime, when that head pressure control valve is not operating, it's just sitting in that receiver, just sitting there waiting, okay? But then all of a sudden when the temperatures drop, boom, and, and the head pressure control valve floods, all that refrigerant is inside there. So what's the proper way to set the refrigerant charge on a head pressure control valve system or, or flooded charge, okay? The best way is to lean on the manufacturer of the equipment and ask them what the proper amount of refrigerant is. Now, there's a problem in that. Right. The next best way is to use Sporlin's 90-30-1 service bulletin. Just Google Sporlin 90-30-1 and you'll get the uh, Sporlin recommended method of charging a uh, system with a head pressure control valve. But the Sporlin method only works for a tube and fin condenser. It will not work for a microchannel condenser. Okay. The third way is an old school method, and that is to fill the system up with the maximum amount of refrigerant, assuming 
what you're doing actually is you're assuming that the system was properly designed from day one. If the system was properly designed from day one, then the receiver and the condenser are big enough to handle that extra flooded charge, okay? With that being said, if you put the maximum amount of refrigerant that system can safely hold, which is about 80% of the condenser when it's pumped down, then you know that you can't have any more refrigerant in the system and you're making an assumption that that is enough to make the system work, okay? So, leaning on the manufacturer to tell you that the flooded charge is an extra six pounds, calculating on a tube and fin condenser with a Sporlin 90-30-1, okay? I have some videos, just look up head pressure control valve or headmaster or winter charge on my channel and you'll see videos on how to calculate the Sporlin 90-30-1 method. The easiest way and the most effective way, in my opinion, when you're out in the field is to put the maximum amount of refrigerant in the system, okay? Yes, you are theoretically selling the customer a little bit of extra refrigerant, but the alternative is, Sometimes it can be difficult to use the Sporlin 90-30-1 method on a tube and fin condenser when it already has refrigerant and it's just low a little bit, okay? There's some weird times when it can be hard to calculate that. There's other times when you can calculate it, okay? But on a microchannel condenser, you have no way of knowing how much refrigerant is in the system. So what I suggest you do is pump the system down. You're going to have to heat the, refri the, the, the receiver up when it's pumped down with a heat producing device that doesn't exceed the soft plug temperature of the receiver. When you heat it up, what you're going to do is you just do a couple passes with that heat producing device. Then you run your, the back of your fingers up and down the receiver and you'll feel the spot where it gets really hot all of a sudden. That would be your liquid level in the receiver when it's pumped down. Okay. Now I personally use a thermal imaging camera to do that. So what I'll do is I'll still use a heat producing device. I'll heat up the receiver when it's pumped down and then I'll take my thermal imaging camera and, and look at it basically, I have lots of videos doing this, and then you can see the level of the liquid. Basically, the point at which the liquid stops and the vapor exists is where you're gonna feel the heat because you're feeling uh, the, the, the liquid is taking a long time to heat up basically, okay? And the vapor is gonna heat up instantly. So that's the point at which you're gonna feel really, really hot, and that'll tell you your liquid level in the system. Now, another really easy way to do this, okay? is if you ever completely take all the refrigerant out of the system, you weigh in what the manufacturer says to put in there, then do that same test of heating up the receiver when it's pumped down. When you put in the factory recommended flooded charge and then take that receiver, pump it down, and then take that heat producing device and mark the liquid level with the factory recommended amount, then you know that the flooded charge is only at two thirds of the receiver and you don't have to add that extra refrigerant. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question. I have a couple videos about it. We'll be talking a lot more about it as we start to get into refrigerant leak problems in the winter time. And we see that issue a lot more. Um, and, uh, but it'll be happening more sooner than most people think because we're already pushing towards the end of August right now. So we'll start getting our first head, um, low charge or, uh, you know, uh, head pressure control valve issues probably the first or second week in October is when we start getting those cool evenings and we start to see the the, the refrigerant leaks. Um, all right, so hopefully I answered your question for you. I'm going to get back to the chat and see what I'm missing in here. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for that super chat that I saw come through a little while ago. Okay. Um, uh, does anyone know what's a good, reliable refrigerant leak detector? Well, Israel... Um, I have always used the DTEC Select. It's been my leak detector of choice for many years now, probably 10 years, if not more. Um, I've used a couple different ones. I've had to replace it a couple times, but it's done me really well. I've heard mixed results on the Inficon uh, DTEC Stratus or Inficon Stratus. I've heard good and bad things about it. So I have no experience on the uh, that one yet, but I've always had really good luck on the DTEC Select leak detector. Been my choice, my one for a long time. So... Um, Mr. Ice, uh, that's an interesting one. You have a 480 volt three phase system with a step down transformer to 208 three phase, and you're having a lot of overamp problems. Thoughts? Uh, that's interesting. I I don't know, Mr. Ice. That's a really interesting one, bud. Um, let me see what else we got going on in here. Um, let me see. Can I bypass a head pressure control valve if it is indoors and in a basement? Uh, Dan, I mean, there, you know, if you aren't going to have low ambient conditions, then, you know, and you're hundred percent sure, then sure. You can take a head pressure control valve out of the system. I mean, but make sure that you know what you're doing before you do so. Okay. Because, you know, maybe it was engineered for a certain reason, but, um, let's see what else we got in here. Uh, um, let me see what else. 
Uh, great, Brett. Uh, if you, if you can't find the videos on my channel, Brett, send me an email and I got plenty of videos on head pressure control valves and setting the winter charge and different stuff like that. Okay. Um, no, uh, Ryan WK, I have not worked with a P66 controller. Um, I've heard about them. That's the fan speed controller. Is it not? I think it is. Uh, I've never used them before. So, um, let me see what else we got. Uh, I already answered that one. Um, okay. So I'm going to go to my list of things to talk about. Um, Evan had asked me a question about what tools do I recommend for new technicians starting out? So that is something that I really do want to work on, uh, in the near future is, is making some videos and setting aside some space on my website for different tools, you know, for new technicians and different things like that. But as a new service technician or as someone getting ready to go apply for an HVAC job, I want you to be very careful about spending a lot of money on tools. Okay. Uh, when you're in trade school, you see these really cool tools and you think, man, I want to have that because your teacher had it. And then you go buy it. And then when you go to work for the service company, you find out, yeah, that thing sucks. Okay. What I would suggest is be very, uh, start putting money aside. Okay. But don't go blow your wad on a bunch of tools because when you get to work, you're going to realize, Hey, I don't even need half this crap. Like I had a guy that used to work for me. He was an apprentice and he came to work for me. And man, he came to work, he was super proud and it was cool, but he came to work with this big tool bag full of tools, okay? And I didn't wanna be rude, but the first day he came to work for me, I said, look, dude, I sat him down, I said, you need to get rid of half that stuff in that bag. You're not gonna need uh, a hammer, okay, in, in, in your tool bag. You're not gonna need um, you know, sheet metal tools in your tool bag. You're not gonna need all that stuff, okay? And I kind of felt bad because I feel like I deflated him because he was super proud because he had this really cool set of tools, right? Um, but I'd be cautious about spending a lot of money on tools, at least just set the money aside. And then when you do get a job, that way you have it. And then, you know, you can talk to the people you're going to work for and find out the tools that you're going to need. Okay. I mean, basic tools for a service technician is, you know, a, a six in one screwdriver, a couple crescent wrenches, you know, um, some wire cutters, some wire strippers, uh, some channel locks and you know a set of service gauges and a nice uh digital meter you know but you don't need to go buy the twelve hundred dollar gauges you don't need to go buy the twelve hundred dollar digital meter i mean you know be you know but don't buy the cheapest harbor freight crap okay but you know you don't just be cautious about spending a bunch of money up front okay and you're, you're the service company you're going to go work for they're going to help you and they're going to say hey you know what you don't need this stuff Okay. And then you're going to, you know, you have wasted your money on it. So just save your money. And then that way, when you get a job, you have the money and boom, you can buy what you think you need or what they recommend. Okay. Um, have I ever come across a condenser fan motor from the recent heat wave? Have I come across bad condenser fan motors from the recent heat wave? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had fan motors fail. I wouldn't say it was because of the heat wave, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't blame it on the heat wave. No. Um, but I mean, the heat wave might've set them over the edge, but I mean, it's just lack of maintenance. Usually it's bearing failure on the condenser fan motors and you know, um, yeah. All right. Let me see what else we got in here. Uh, <laughs> apparently we have a chat douche. Um, good job moderators on the chat douche, getting rid of the chat douche. You guys are the best moderators ever. All right. You know, the funny thing is my moderator paid me. Go figure that Adam. As a moderator, you have to pay me. Keep paying me, Adam. You got to pay me because you're my moderator. <laughs> All right, let's see what else. Um, being an HVAC technician is expensive, but you also don't want to spend the money on the wrong things. Okay, so um, what is a good replacement for R12? 409 is very expensive, 580 a drum. Uh, R12, I use 409A. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. There's hot shots and different other flavors of, of different things, but... I have always been a 409A fan. It's worked beautifully for, beautifully for me. Uh, don't have any issues with it. You know, if you have no other options, I mean, you can go back with R12. You can still get R12, but it's probably more expensive than 409A. So um, let's see what else. Um, what else we got in here? Okay, I'm going to get to my list of things. I laughed in the moderator's face. Yeah. All right. Did I ever work on a 744 systems? No, 744. I always get mixed up. Is that... Ammonia or is that water? 717 is water. 744 is ammonia. No, I've never worked on that. I think it is. I could be wrong though. Um, all right, let's see what else. Uh, 
Frank asks about basic troubleshooting videos, and this is a great thing, okay? I want to address this right now too. So first off, let me read Frank's question. So Frank had asked me about basic troubleshooting videos so I can create for an end user. So not for a service technician, but an end user can use to inform their service tech um, before the service tech comes out to try to help the service tech be more prepared for the service calls. Okay, so let's start this all. In my last video, at the end of my video, um, I made sure that um, I addressed the whole DIY thing, okay? I am not a DIY channel, nor will I ever be a DIY channel, okay? Do it yourself. What I mean is, is I don't want to make videos that will allow business owners to try to repair their own equipment and not have to call a service technician, okay? I want to be careful when I say that though, okay? Because I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, all right? I don't ever want to take another service technician's job. Terry, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate it, okay? Um, I'll, let's see, opening back up on your stores, but equipment, what's back on unemployment? Oh, yeah. Um, so I am not a DIY channel, but I also am sympathetic to people and do understand that there is some very intuitive people that will clean their own equipment. Okay. Uh, I don't make my videos for those people, but I realize that some people can watch certain aspects of my videos and realize, Hey, I can just hose that off, but you have to be careful and you have to understand. And that's why I don't make DIY videos because there's some simple things that I may show in my videos, but they actually might be quite dangerous, like hosing off a condenser. Did someone see me turn it off? You know, I mean, there's electrocution that can happen. There's, you know, opening a panel and there's a condenser fan blade right there and they reach in to grab the capacitor and they get their hands stuck in there, okay? That's not good. So that's why I don't want to become a DIY channel. But at the same time, I already, with my existing service customers, try to walk my customers through service calls before I even go out as a courtesy to them, okay? So um, would I consider making videos that give people... Um, things that they can check before they call service technicians. It's an interesting idea, but it is a very gray area. I don't know if I quite want to go there. What I would consider doing is making some videos that basically explain in layman's terms the basic principles of refrigeration and air conditioning maybe, but I don't know if I would make videos that give troubleshooting steps, okay? What I would suggest is Ask your service contractor, because like I said, I do that for my existing customers already. When my customer calls me and says, hey, my walk-in freezer's not working, we might spend 10 to 15 minutes on the phone before I dispatch a service technician. I said, hey, did you check the circuit breakers? No. Did you get a delivery today? Yeah. Why don't you go check the circuit breaker real quick? Come back. You know what? Circuit breaker was off. Was it off or was it tripped? It was off. And then I'll ask him, do you know the difference between tripped? Yeah. Okay. So it was off. You just flipped it on and that was it. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe they just got a delivery and maybe someone left it off. I just did a service for my customer because they appreciate the fact that I walked them through those steps and eliminated a, a, an unnecessary service call. Did I just lose money for my company? Theoretically, yes. Because, you know, if I was looking for the quick buck, I could have sent a service technician out there to spend two hours after we reset the breaker and then go through the entire system. I could have done that. Okay. But it could be just something as simple as, the breaker was turned off because the cooks did what they were supposed to do. When they were loading the box for two hours, they shut the breaker off and then someone forgot to turn it back on. Okay. So I already do that with my customers. So I really don't know if it's my place to make videos that tell people to do all that stuff or if they just need to find a contractor that's willing to walk them through basic troubleshooting steps. I think it's probably best to leave that up to the contractor because and while I realize that telling the customer to check certain circuit breakers or different things is a good thing, at the same time, it takes the service company out of the picture and doesn't let the service company in on some valuable information. So if I know that my customer called me and said, hey, you know what? Last week, I found the circuit breaker tripped for my air conditioner and I reset it, okay? And then they called me again two weeks later and they said, you know what? I found the circuit breaker tripped again, but I reset it. First off, I would tell them, if you've ever reset a circuit breaker, I, I tell my customers, don't ever reset it more than once. If you, if you reset a circuit breaker, which I don't really tell them to do, you only get one shot. If it trips again, don't do it again. But what I'm saying is, is if I had a customer that called me and kept me in the loop and said, hey, you know what? I checked this. I checked that. The, the breaker was tripped. It helps me as a service technician, okay? So there's a fine line there between making that video for my channel 
and taking the other service company out of the picture? I don't know. I'm kind of torn on that one, and I'd have to think about that a little bit more. But all right, let's see what else. Um, what am I missing? Uh, how can I check to see if a tandem compressor is efficient in terms of good or bad valves? Uh, if it's a scroll compressor, you got to lean on the manufacturer of that particular compressor. Um, as far as a semi-hermetic, you're not going to see very many tandem semi-hermetics, I don't think. But if I mean, you might see some. But if it's a, a tandem semi-hermetic, you can do a valve test on the compressor. But if it's a scroll or a reciprocating compressor, you're going to have to lean on the manufacturer, test the compression ratio, find out what a good compression ratio is according to the manufacturer. So you're really going to need to lean on the manufacturer to find that out. Um, let me see what else. Molly, thank you very much for that super chat. Why does 410A cause so many leaks? It doesn't. 410A doesn't cause the leaks. Leaks happen because of improper installation, poor manufacturing. 410A just happens to have higher pressures, so leaks are more prevalent when you have inefficiency in the manufacturing process, in crappy copper, in the brazing materials. Um, so it's not 410's fault. 410 is not a bad refrigerant. It runs under higher pressures, so we have to do a better job of manufacturing, installing, and maintaining equipment. Um, that may be why people think they see more leaks in 410A, just because it runs higher pressures, you know, but it's not a bad refrigerant at all. Um, let me see what else. Um, So Mitch had said that he's never done a change out on a commercial walk-in cooler and his boss is asking him to do one. Uh, I would say it's not a good idea if you don't have someone that's never done something like that before. Walk-in coolers are pretty big um, jobs and you really need, there's a lot of variables that go into walk-in cooler equipment. I mean, yeah, you can just go in there and slap in a condensed unit, but is it installed right? Why are you changing it? What is wrong with the existing equipment? Uh, is the evaporator sized properly? Is there leaks? I mean, you really need to know what you're doing. So I personally wouldn't go blindly into a job like that if you've never done something like that. Um, let me see what else. Uh, what am I missing? Molly, thank you very much for that super chat. Uh, everything causes cancer in California. That is absolutely correct. Um, cheap copper. Yep. All right. Uh, the air causes cancer in California. That is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, all right. Let me get into my list of things to talk about here. So um, I already answered that one. And thermal imager, I had a question about what th I've been actually seeing a lot of questions about that. What thermal imaging camera do I use? I've kind of already addressed that. The FLIR 1 Pro is the one that I've been using lately. Uh, one of these days, I'll get around to doing that review video on the three thermal imaging cameras that I have. Um, but again, that hasn't been a huge priority. So um, uh, Dave, Dave Johnson asked, where has Molly been the last month? <laughs> Molly, do you want to address that one? Where have you been the last month? All right. Uh, let's see what else. Even water cancels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, this is a great question and I'm going to address this right now. So I had a commenter and I've now, of course, if, if we had major health issues, if I saw a customer doing something insane, of course, I would be inclined to have to do something. I don't know why the screen just glitched like that. That was weird. I saw it too on my side, like the, the stream like went away for a second and then came back. That was weird. Um, but, uh, I don't have any, I'm not dropping frames or anything like that. So I don't know what the heck that dysfunction was about. Um, but, uh, hold on just one second. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So anyways, I lost my train of thought with the whole screen glitching like that. Um, where was I at? Uh, so as far as the customers not following proper food practices, uh, you know what? I don't get involved with that. Did the customer throw away all the food in the walk-in box? That's, that's not my problem. I don't know. Okay. I'm not there. I'm not a health and sanitation officer. I'm not a sworn officer of the state or anything like that. Of course, if I saw something crazy, crazy, I'd be inclined to like bring it up to a higher up manager or something like that. But that's about as far as I would go. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, all kinds of special people that are super fancy and, you know, they, they work for the government and they handle all that stuff. Okay. So I'm not getting involved in reporting a restaurant because I saw a mouse in there, or if I saw a roach in a region, or if I saw a nasty food, like I'll bring it up to the manager's attention for sure. Okay. But no, I don't get involved with the health department. I'm not trying to bite off the hand that feeds me. So, um, yeah, the stream was low on charge. Uh, how can you tell if a company is BS when applying? That's that's a really hard one, bud. Um, what you need to do, yeah, I don't know, man. 
you need to interview the company. You, I mean, I suggest you go on a ride along with them. I suggest that you go and talk to the supply houses, ask them if the company is a quality company. Um, you know, I mean, you just got to do your due diligence and start doing some work and research yourself. Okay. Uh, let me see what else. How did I start getting clients when I started my business? So Charlie, so my dad actually started this business and I kind of partnered with him probably about 10 years ago and, uh, we run it together now, but my dad, um, his first customer, he started working for someone else and he made contacts. And when he left that company, he had new contacts and started working with them and then built his reputation up. Uh, our very, f probably our second customer that we ever had as a company, we still have as a customer today. And this business was started in 1989. So we've had some of the same customers for all that time, uh, just by being honest and, um, you know, being forthcoming with the customer. Uh, we don't advertise. We've been lucky enough to um, just be honest. And when managers leave a restaurant, they take us with us to another restaurant and it builds our reputation and just moves on. Uh, when would it be a good time to leave a job you would assume before summer season? Mr. Green. Well, as a business owner, I would appreciate as much notice as possible. Um, and, you know, but you need to make the best decision for you and your family. Uh, as far as, you know, before summer. I mean, that's a hard one. You know, that's a real hard one. You know, I, I would suggest you send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I can try to address that a little bit more. Um, Dylan, do I spend any money on advertising? No, it is all word of mouth for us. Um, we're lucky enough in that case. What is my take on spin flare and swages? Uh, I've never used the spin flare. Um, I use the spin swage and it's cool, but the spin swage, um, is never never makes a perfect swage. It's always a little crooked. Um, if you don't hold the drill perfectly straight, it makes it crooked. So in that respect, I don't think I would ever trust the spin flare because if you don't get it perfectly straight, then how's that gonna work right for a flare? So uh, I have a flaring tool. It's an old um, yellow jacket flaring tool I've had forever. It works great. It's been my go-to. And that's what I use. So I use the spin swage, but not the spin flare. Was there a service call that both condenser fan motors were going bad on the same unit? Yeah, I've had, sir, actually I had a service call. One of my guys went on a service call over the weekend and he had two bad condenser fan motors at the same time. So yeah, it happens all the time. Uh, most of the time it's not both bad at the same time. It's one's been bad for a while and the other one finally took a crap too. Um, so, uh, you know, in my recent video, I used a, uh, a mister on my wand or essentially a sprinkler, right, to hose down a condenser to get them through the night. And someone had asked a comment and they made a good point. They said, hey, wait a minute. I Because someone had asked me, I think in my last live stream or one of the previous live streams, what I thought about these misting devices for residential air conditioning systems. And, you know, there's these things on Facebook and whatever, and it's these chinguses you put on your air conditioner and it has a sprinkler timer and it turns on a sprinkler, you know, and miss your air conditioner to drop the condensing temp and all that stuff. And someone had asked my opinion on that. And they said, and I basically told them, hell no, not in California. We have such hard water. The calcium deposits would eat that condenser alive and it would just ruin it. So then that same person said, hey, but you use a mister to get someone through the night. Well, it's one thing putting a mister on a condenser overnight versus leaving it on for months at a time, okay? Not very much calcium is going to build up on that condenser overnight, okay? So, you know, I do, uh, using a mister in refrigeration or a sprinkler or, you know, um, like the plastic round sprinkler things, that's pretty common in refrigeration. We do what we got to do to get the customer running, you know, and then you'll come back. And sometimes in certain situations, like I have a couple customers that we just have to mist things and it, and it leaves calcium like crazy. But sometimes you get these really hot summers. Two years ago, we had 120 degree um, summer. We had like two days where it was 120 degrees outside. Condensers were just going crazy. They were overheating everywhere. Compressors were going off on thermal overload. And the only thing that would get us through that massive heat wave was putting sprinklers and misters on every condenser we came across because it just, our equipment wasn't designed for high temperatures like that. So sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, but on a permanent basis, I don't suggest it. All right, what else? Um, what else we got in here? Is R32 being phased out? I have no idea, Molly, not that I know of though. Um, let's see what else. Chingus, yes, Jessica. Chingus, for those, <laughs> I get so many, 
so many questions. It kind of makes me laugh because I have a bunch of funky phrases, just like Dave. Dave has some awesome phrases that I even find myself um, saying, you know, after hearing Dave, multiple offender and plugo buggo and different things like that, right? I'm talking about NorCal Dave. Uh, if you guys don't already know, go check out his YouTube channel. He's flipping awesome. I don't know if any of the moderators can possibly post Dave's YouTube channel link in here. Excuse me. Um, if you could post Dave's YouTube channel link, that would be awesome. But yeah, NorCal has some funny stuff. But anyways, I have some weird phrases that I use too. And uh, Chingus is one of them. Chingus basically is a word to describe something that at the moment I can't think of the name of it. Anytime there's just something that's like, oh man, what's that thing called? It's called a Chingus, you know? Um, there's another phrase that you use, uh, Jesus clip. Jesus clip is like, it's it's a clip it's like a cotter pin, right? If you can't think of the name of a cotter pin, we would always call it a Jesus clip. Why? I don't know. Cause it's a miracle maybe that it holds whatever it is together. You know, it's just those weird names that you come up for things when you can't think of the name. Okay. So Chingus has been my word of the day lately. Uh, whenever I can't think of something, I just call it a Chingus. Um, I live in a primarily Hispanic, um, neighborhood and you know, that's like uh, slang, um, California, Spanish, uh, chinga, chingus. I think it even has some bad meanings too. Um, different things, but there's, yeah, whatever. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, all right. I think that's pretty much it on my list. Um, so how to troubleshoot. So this was a question that I had and I don't understand. Yeah, I don't know about that one. So why don't you guys ask me some questions in the chat? I'll try to get to them right now. Make sure you put your questions in, uh, in, uh, caps lock and I'll try to get to them. Okay, guys. So throw them in the chat and I'll try to address them real quick. Um, yeah, Chris. Yeah. So Brett said he worked on a train unit today and he's asking if he's allowed to drink. Um, Hey, you know what? So people ask me all the time, like, what's my favorite unit? What unit do I hate? I was just having this conversation with a manager today because I was working on an isomatic ice machine. I'm not a fan of isomatic ice machines, but I was explaining to the manager, it's not that I think they're a bad machine in all honesty. I just don't work on them enough to be super comfortable with them. In that same retrospect, when I'm working on package units, I don't work on train equipment very much. And in all honesty, to be completely fair, I don't completely understand trains control system. Okay. I've never been, I've never completely understood it. And it's probably simply because I don't spend enough time trying to figure it out. Okay. I don't work on very many train package units. Therefore I'm not as comfortable with them. I think that we all tend to say, Oh, we hate these. I'm not a fan of York package units. Okay. But it, you know, if I worked on them every day, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. But I work on Linux package units all the time, carrier package units all the time, Manitowoc ice machines, Kyrak regions, Delfield regions. They all have their own pain in the ass things that they do, but I'm just used to them. So it's not that big of a deal, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, if I had to work on train package units all day and I was getting my head, you know, my head hurt and all that stuff, sure, I'd want to drink when I got home too. So um, let's see what else. How many technicians do I have currently and do I have an install side. No, William, I'm a very small service company. I have four trucks on the road, including my own. So I have three service technicians that work for me. Um, no, we do not have an install team. We all do the same work. Uh, just started trade school. How often am I doing high level math on the job? Wilfred, Wilfredo, Wilfredo, Wilfredo. Um, sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, actually we do some pretty complex math in our heads quite often. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say complex. So um, some algebra you do on the daily. Um, you'll do some, uh, figuring out superheat subcooling in your head. Uh, you know, yeah, we have digital gauges that do it for us, but oftentimes you have to know when things are inaccurate. Um, dealing with, uh, weight measurements all the time. Uh, BTU conversions, finding out how many uh, tons this unit has, uh, BTU capacity, different stuff like that. So you are doing mathematical calculations in your head, but a lot of the times you have a calculator you can do too. So um, preference VFD or ECM for both of them suck if they don't have proper power conditioning for sure. So, um, do I ever get any work on the data centers out there? No, Sam, I don't do any data work. How many, I already answered that one. Um, am I in Southern California or Northern? I'm in Southern California. So, uh, my service company is in Riverside, California. Pros and cons of package unit versus split for residential use. Um, I mean, 
both of them are going to have ductwork in the attic. I, I really don't have a, a, a preference. Package units typically look ugly when they're on the roof. They make your roof line look like crap. Uh, I imagine that if you can install a package unit on the ground and it's in a well-ventilated area, it'd probably be awesome because um, your potential for refrigerant leaks in the attic would be better or you know lower, uh, but you would just have a longer ductwork run. Um, yeah, I mean, I really don't have a preference either way. Let me see what else we got in here. Is there any updates on the walk-in freezer with the oil log evaporator coil? John Deere, no, customers still, they've just been trucking along, really haven't had any complaints about it. I'm sure that we'll get another call here in a couple weeks or a couple months. Um, but no, they, I haven't even had to go out and de-ice it recently either. It's still running to this day. So, um, let me see. Will I be doing more schematic breakdowns? Yeah, sure. I will try to do it more and more when are polo shirts coming. Um, you know, funny enough, I actually had a mock-up for a polo shirt, but it's just not something that I think I can bring all the sizes in. So right now I just do these ones. Uh, for those of you that just came in here, I am working on, or that just came in, I am working with my, um, designer right now for some beanies so we're gonna currently right now tentatively i'm gonna have three different designs for beanies um i'm not gonna reveal what they look like yet but uh we're working on those ones so those will be coming hopefully by the winter time we'll have those ready it's it's a process of getting samples and mock-ups and all that crap but we are working on it so right now we just simply have the hats and the shirts and we have plenty of the large extra large hats on the website right now at hvacrvideos.com so um, jump on them before we completely run out again. <laughs> All right, let me see what else we got in here. Uh, am I going to watch the new Bill and Ted movie? Of course I'm going to watch the new Bill and Ted movie. Of course it will never replace the original Bill and Ted movies. Those were my jams when they first came out. I think I saw them both in the movie theater when they came out. Um, but yeah, no, I'm going to watch the new one for sure. All right. Uh, can I see up server? No, you cannot, Brian M. All right, um, let me see what else we got in here. Yes, they are fitted hats. They are flex fit with a black underbill so that way your fingers don't get them dirty. Um, they are a breathable mesh material. You can't see this, but I can actually see light through this hat. So they help to breathe. Um, we have large, extra large, and small mediums. I purposely made them without my logo. They just say HVACR so that way you guys can wear them to work without representing my brand. That was the whole thing because I don't want to represent HVACR videos when I go work for my service company. Vice versa, I figured, you know, I don't want my service techs representing other businesses and different things like that. So that's why I made that hat. It just has my color scheme on it. That's the only thing. Um, so that's a maybe on the polo shirts. I don't know, man. It's just too hard on the sizes. The, the, with the shirts, here's the thing. Right now, I have 4XL, 3XL, 2XL, XL, large, medium, and small. Um, I have to order... 244 shirts at a time to get certain pricing. So to do polo shirts that many, I don't think I would sell enough polo shirts to order all those because that's a huge expense out of my pocket for them to sit on the shelf for a really long time. But um, let me see what else. Uh, right on. Thanks for the support, Road Toads. I really appreciate it. Did I design my current logo? Um, I did not personally design it. I had a lot of help in designing that. My cousin actually helped me and then I had someone refine it and different. It's been kind of evolved, but, um, no, I did not design it, but I did have like creative help, you know, making sure like, Hey, this is what I want it to look like and that kind of stuff. So, um, let me see what else we got in here. Uh, do I talk with Andrew Greaves? Um, Albert asks if I talk with AK. No, I recently had an email exchange with AK just to ask him how he was doing. Uh, he said he was doing good. I don't personally know AK. I met him at the AHR show this last year. A uh, really cool dude, very nice guy. Um, but no, I, I don't talk with him on a regular. Uh, I did have an email exchange with him recently, and he said he's been pretty busy at work, but um, just not really doing. He just kind of changed his path and not really doing the YouTube stuff right now. I don't know if he'll ever do it again, but you know, I can't really answer for him. So. Uh, thank you very much for that super chat. I really appreciate it. Where can you get trained education for work in the LA area? You have some experience. Um, mm, that's a good question, bud. Send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I can probably talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, what kind of fitting do I use to attach the nitrogen to the piping for the brazing? There's a couple different methods that you can do. So if you're just doing it into raw pipe, they actually make a step down fitting. It looks like a step bit. For drilling holes and things but it's actually just step down for different pipe sizes and you can jam it into the pipe and it kind of seals up pretty good 
Um, you can use it to do a nitrogen purge and a nitrogen sweep. Um, the other thing is I have a couple other fittings. Um, I've done some creative stuff where I've literally taken my refrigerant hose and put it in seven eighths and taped it on. Um, also, if you have service fittings, you can pre-pipe the entire system, hook them up to your normal hoses, you know, thread them onto the quarter inch fittings and purge that way too. So um, let me see what else. Uh, all right, guys, at this point, we're going to, uh, well, I'll give you a few more minutes to ask any more uh, tech-related questions that you have. I'll give you a few more minutes, throw in some more technical-related questions, whatever. Um, do I record every job that I go to? No, not necessarily. I try to, though. So I do have a hard drive full of um, failed videos, basically. So, you know, I started recording, and then the customer turned up the, the, the mariachi music in the back of the restaurant, and that's a huge copyright and it takes too much work to try to edit out the music, so the video just goes nowhere. But I try to film everything, even if I know it's gonna turn into a good video or not, that way I have stuff to fall back on. Um, I have quite a backlog of footage. Uh, some things that are a little bit harder to edit, so therefore they may take a while, you know, or I may not ever turn them into a video, and then some easy stuff. Um, let me see what else. My thoughts on the train duct calculator. Uh, Rich, I mean, you know, it really depends. I'm not a huge design person, okay? But I do have an understanding on static pressures and friction rates and different things like that, okay? The biggest problem with duct calculators is majority of them out there are not for flex duct. And in California, 90% of our equipment is flex duct, okay? Uh, the, the flow rates on flex duct is totally different. And Rich, I know you know this, but I'm just saying this for the stream. Uh, the flow rates on flex are totally different. A lot of people have designed systems in the past using a non flex duct calculator and then a, just use flex duct. So if it said to use 12 inch duct, well, that's with no insulation, you know, not flex basically. And it, you know, it just becomes a problem. So my thoughts on the train duct calculator, honestly, I've never used the train duct calculator. I have a couple of them sitting in my office. I've never had the need to use them because again, I'm not a huge design person. Um, the few systems that I have designed, uh, I've used WriteSoft for, and they've basically been my own home, my off, actually my office, my mom's house, and someone else's, uh, another friend's house where I did, you know, a whole system change out. And basically, I just used WriteSoft, um, did a box, box load calculation, and, you know, came, found my flow rates and set the house up that way. So I never actually used a duck calculator. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Uh, can I go over pay scale on what a beginner all the way up to lead pay should be? Frank, the problem with that is, is it changes from every place. I mean, here in Southern California, um, an apprentice can probably start out at 18 to $19 an hour. Um, uh, an advanced level service technician working in restaurants and stuff like that can probably make $35 an hour. A supervisor can make up to $45 an hour. If you get into heavy industrial, you can make $55 to $65 an hour. Supermarkets, you can, I mean, it all depends on the, there's so many different aspects to this trade. And that can completely change going to Vegas, Arizona, going to the Midwest, going to up north, Canada. Everywhere is going to have different pay scales. So it really depends on the area that you're working in. Um, how do I troubleshoot a semi-hermetic compressor shutting off and it's... Oh, okay, so I remember that question, Brent. I saw that on my thing. Um, so how do you troubleshoot a semi-hermetic compressor that's shutting off and it's not on high or low pressure? Well, okay, so there's some holes in your question there. First off, does it have... Is it single phase or three phase? Does it have correct voltage going to the compressor? Okay, what is causing the compressor to shut off? Is it off on thermal overload? So is the thermal overload lurk working correctly? Okay, if the thermal overload is working correctly, then you have an issue with compressor cooling. Okay, oftentimes, depending on what kind of a compressor it is, you might need a head cooling fan for that semi hermetic compressor. Is there airflow going across the compressor from a condenser fan motor? Um, do you have, a, is it a water cooled compressor? I mean, there's so many different things on that question. So if you have proper power going to it and the compressor is turning on and off on thermal overload, you would have to check the thermal limit switch or the thermal overload. Then, um, you know, you probably have uh, an issue inside of your compressor. It could be an oil issue. It could be, you know, uh, just a bad compressor. I mean, there's so many different variables to that one. Okay. Um, 
again, I know I told you to watch the stream, but you or actually you had asked me before. You probably want to send me an email on that one and maybe you can give me some more details about your exact situation and I might be able to help you a bit more. So um, two ice machine TXVs tomorrow for the first time. What to expect? Depends on what type of ice machines they are, Brian. Um, remember that on ice machines, and this is something that I had to remember today. Most ice machines, if they are remote ice machines, you need to do three-point recoveries. So when you're recovering all the, the refrigerant out of the machine, you need to hook onto three different points. Oftentimes, there's several check valves and solenoid valves that if you power down the machine and you just simply hook up to the high and the low side, um, it's there's still going to be refrigerant trapped in the machine between a check valve and a solenoid valve or different things like that. So follow the manufacturer's instructions on proper recovery for that ice machine. And the same thing goes for evacuation too. When you have an ice machine that you re require to do a three-point recovery, like on a Manitowoc quiet cube machine, or um, even on the Hoshizaki machines, you know, there's there's ways you can get around the three-point recovery, but you got to understand the operation of the machine. Okay, um, those are some tips I can give you about that. Uh, let's see what else we got in here. Uh, high superheat, low subcool, clear sight glass, 404 clogged TXV. High superheat, low subcool. Clear sight glass, 404 clogged TXV. Bill, first off, the subcooling number just uh, is irrelevant to me. Um, especially if it has a TXV and it's got a receiver, you're going to, I mean, what do you consider low subcooling? See, subcooling is a hard measurement to pay attention to when you have a receiver. Uh, typically on receiver systems, I see, if I see three degrees subcooling, I'm happy. Okay. Uh, if you have a clear sight glass, remember the sight glass is only a window into the system at that exact point in the system. Okay. So high superheat, low subcool, clear sight glass, 404, clogged TXV. No, no, clogged TXV, no. Because if your TXV is not metering the right refrigerant, that's a hard one, Bill. I need some more information. Send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com with some more information. What kind of system, low temp, high temp, um, what refrigerant, that kind of stuff. And I could probably help you a little bit more. All right, let's see what else we got in here. Um... All right. I'm not the pimp. I'm just a dude. Any opinions on the Watt Saver QT6000 from Quick Products? Never used it. Don't even know what it is. Uh, Quick Products, so I'm not a fan of all their products. I, I know they make some, like, the the acid tests and different things like that. And I'm not a fan of that. So I don't know what the thing that you were asking me about is, though. Um, high superheat, high subcoolant. Wait, what? Let me see. No, it, it said low subcoolant. I'm not tripping, am I? Did I miss that up? High superheat, low sub... No, see, I see it. High superheat, low subcoolant. Yeah. Do I use approach temp on some HVAC units or subcoolant superheat? Well, if you're working on Linux units, the factory doesn't give you superheat and subcooling numbers. They tell you approach temperature. So, yes, I do use approach on Linux units quite often. Um, all right. Let's see what else we got in here. Okay, guys. At this point, I am going to end the discussion uh, about Tech Talk. If I missed any questions technical... You guys can send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. If you guys have personal questions to ask me right now, shoot, go ahead. I'll give you a few more minutes, and then I'm going to go eat dinner. So um, throw the personal questions out. If you guys got them, uh, put them in caps lock, and I'll try to address them. So this last weekend, I started off the stream by saying uh, my wife and I went up to our local mountain resort, Lake Arrowhead, and we um, uh, celebrated our anniversary. We took our two kids with us. Uh, we went up to Lake Arrowhead Resort hung out for the weekend. Um, I took Friday off. We went up Friday afternoon after my kids got out of fake internet school, right? So they got out of school or they got to log off their computers at two o'clock. And so we bounced, got up there and spent the weekend just hanging out in the mountains. It was nice to escape um, the heat. You know, it was only like 85 degrees up there all weekend. Uh, there was a lake. We were able to swim in the swimming pool and just hang out. Uh, it was our 15 year anniversary. So that's awesome. Super stoked. I'm awesome. I'm like super blown away that my wife still is with me after 15 years of my crap. Um, but thank you, Jill. Appreciate it. <laughs> she doesn't watch these, but um, yeah, it was awesome though. It was a nice weekend. It was nice to get away. Believe it or not, we actually enjoyed having our kids there because it was just like, we're a family. Like we really do appreciate spending time together and stuff like that. And my wife and I would have kind of felt weird not being around our kids over this weekend. So um, what is my streaming PC specifications? Keith, what I would suggest you do, hold on just one second and I'll pull up something for you right now. Um, Keith, if you're interested in my PC specs, I'm going to post a link to the discord server. 
Um, my PC specs are posted uh, in the Discord server. If you can't find them, just ask. Uh, um, just ask uh, anybody in the Discord server, and they'll direct you. Ask one of the mods. They they have my PC specs that I do for streaming. So um, I I don't remember them to be honest with you. So uh, let me see what else. Um, what is my? I already answered that one. How often do I work on chillers? I've never worked on chiller, bud. Um, are, am I going to drive to Bill's house and kick his dog? No. All right. Uh, what's the smartwatch that I wear? Uh, it's the Galaxy Active 2 or the Samsung Active 2. Uh, it's the bigger active watch. Um, nothing fancy. Uh, 26 years. Congrats, Rich. Um, pineapple Pizza Samuel. They, you're the man, dude. I'm going to say this right now. Pineapple, jalapenos, tomatoes, and onions are the best thing on pizza ever. Right there. That is the perfect pizza. Put some bacon on there too, and it's even better. But pineapple definitely belongs on pizza. For the haters, just you're dead to me. Okay? Pineapple's the best. All right. Um, what is my average score in bowling? Uh, it has been so long since I have bowled, I don't even remember. Uh, I, I haven't bowled in probably five years. Um, Let's see. Uh, Measure Quick versus Field Piece Job Link. Um, I use Measure Quick all the time. The Field Piece Job Link app serves a purpose too. Um, there's there's times that I've actually I have to think about this. There's times that I've actually used the Job Link app over the Measure Quick app. But Measure Quick is just an amazing app. You have so much information at your fingertips. So um, let me see. How come catfish don't have kittens? That's a good question. I don't know. Ever do a factory paid install on an ice machine? Seems very cheap. Sean Mack. No, I hate doing warranty work. I hate factory work because they never pay correctly. Um, they're always jerks about that. So I'd rather them give that work to some other people. I mean, if I was completely dead, I would take it, but I hate doing warranty work. The only reason why I do warranty work as it is, is because my customers like demand that I do it to do their service work. They ask that I do their warranty work too. So, all right. <laughs> uh, when do I plan on retiring? I wish I could retire tomorrow. I wish I could retire tomorrow and just travel the States filming and stuff like that. That'd be awesome. All right. Um, silicone ring. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Silicone ring are awesome. So I wear a Quelo ring. Uh, you can buy like knockoff Quelo rings, but I think this is like 15, 20 bucks or something like that on Amazon. A lot of people think it's real. They scream at me. Don't wear a metal ring. No, it's silicone all day long. I don't want to lose my finger. Um, I don't even think I can fit my normal wedding ring on. The cool thing about these silicone rings is you can go buy a couple different colors and then you can just change the colors whenever you want. So I have a gray one that I'll put on every once in a while, but I like the black one. It's awesome. All right. Uh, am I dealing with any fires? Not in my area right now, Jeremy. Um, did I send Adam his beer glass? Hold on. Um, nope. Still underneath my cabinet over here. So... One of these, maybe that's why Adam gave me 20 bucks in the super chat because he wanted me to send him a beer glass. Maybe that's what it is. All right. Am I Gillette or Sh uh, Schick razor guy? Um, no, I don't use either of them. I use Dollar Shave Club. I don't know what I use. It's not Gillette or Schlick or Schick or whatever. No, it's, um, it's not Dollar Shave Club, though. There's another one that... It used to be like the one that you paid for a subscription service, but you can actually get them at Target now too, whatever it is. I don't shave very often, as you guys can tell. I, I run like five o'clock shadow all the time. So, um, <laughs> no, pineapple's the best. Uh, remember to like it. Yeah. Um, let me see what else we got in here. Do I ever see myself being tech support if my body gets too messed up to keep doing this work? I don't know if I can actually handle tech support work. I mean, genuinely, because the questions that I get, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can handle tech support. I sometimes, I mean, even with my own texts, it's like, man, I just need to go out there and get my hands on it. I can figure it out. You know, like, I don't know if I can handle over the phone stuff all the time. Um, how do I deal with work burnout? I'm assuming that's what you're asking me, Joe. That's a really hard one, man. Um, I, I mean, I, I need to, I need to do this more often, but I think to take more time off is a huge thing. Uh, but you know, I was thinking about something this weekend is my wife and I were away for the weekend and I was just like, man, you know, we got to figure something out because we, 
in the States especially, but I mean, it's not even just in the States because there's other countries that probably do a better job at this, but they're not doing good financially. But we, we literally work our asses off, right? So that we, we can someday relax when we retire, but half the time people die before they retire. So it's like, why do we work so hard trying to achieve this mythical day that some people don't ever make it to? You know, like we bust our butts to try to make so much money, you know, money, money, money so we can survive. But at the same time, it's not just that we're working so hard. It's that we all want these materialistic things, right? I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I like to have a nice car, you know, uh, my wife and I, you know, we, we went through the whole, um, I made a video on it, but we went through the whole Dave Ramsey debt snowball. We paid off debt like five years ago, something like that. And we got debt free. And, uh, but then, you know, even debt free, even knowing everything that we knew and following all Dave Ramsey's plans, and he really did help us. It was awesome. Right. The total money makeover thing. But, um, even getting through that, we still, when we wanted a new car, we went and financed a new car because I wanted something nice. I wanted my wife to drive a nice, whatever, you know, she drives a Honda and it's like, I wanted her to have a nice family car. And it's like, you know, yeah, we probably, we knew better. We should have financed or not. We should have paid cash for something really small like Dave says, and worked our way up. Instead, we find out something because we wanted something nice and shiny and new. So especially in the States, we have this, this fixation on having shiny and new. And uh, I think that's what gets us into a lot of trouble. I don't know the answer because I'm just as guilty of it. You know, when I want to go out to dinner, I go out to dinner, even though I probably should be saving money, you know, um, I still go out and do what I want. So I don't know. I, I just, i I kind of was thinking this weekend, it's like, man, we, I work so hard, you know, thinking of this day that I can retire. And it's like, why can't I live now and just continue to work, but, but have a blast now? You get what I'm saying? Like, I really wish that we could just chill out and have fun now and not be so obsessed or so needed. You know, it, it sucks that at my service company, I have to, I have to be there every single day to make everything flow smoothly. And if I'm not, everything falls apart. And it's like, man, that sucks. You know, I really wish that we could just live more, you know, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I don't know the answer to that. It's just a, a nightmare. So, um, all right. <laughs> no, my wife doesn't drive a BMW. So, um, will it fix your looks? Yeah. Money makeover. Work for living, not living for work. and But it's so hard to do that. So it's, it, yeah. <laughs> you guys, the comments are funny. Oh, man. Have I used Firefox before, by the way? Thank you for the AVGAC Overtime shirt. Uh, John Deere fan. Right on. Uh, Adam probably sent you that shirt. Don't thank me for it. Um, have I used Firefox? Yeah, I've used it, but I'm, I'm a Google Chrome person. So uh, what's that on the top right of my organizer? That is a uh, hermetic compressor analyzer. So essentially, it's got a bunch of switches and capacitors in it, and you're able to test starting components. It's kind of an antiquated tool. I mean, it still serves a purpose, but it's rather large. I can pretty much do the same thing that that can do with a uh, universal start cap, a universal run cap, uh, a set of jumpers, and a meter. Um, but that definitely, I, I learned on that. That was my uh, compressor analyzer. Um, and then the one small one next to it is just another form of a compressor analyzer. That's a, a, a Annie is what that is. Okay. Um, tech life. We have no life. Yeah. I, I want to live a little bit more. So it's better to live rich than die rich. That's, and that's so true, rich. It definitely is. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. Um, I definitely want to, I want to enjoy life more though. And I feel like with the stress and stuff that I go through, um, the anxiety that I have and all that stuff and the anger and, you know, I just get so angry sometimes and stuff. And I just feel like that's taking my life away every single time that that happens. And is it worth it? Like, am I, am I being stressed and angry about everything? So that way I'm not going to be here 10 years from now, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. Like, you know, I don't know. I just, I hate the fact that we all look forward to retirement. It just, it's, if you think about it, that's just a weird thing. Like I look forward to retirement. I, I wish that we could just look forward to now and, you know, and, and just work and, you know, but we just, we're just, I don't know, our, it, I don't know the answer to it. It's just, it's a mess. So, um, do I think I could show, no, I'm not going to show a gun on my stream. No, never mind. Uh, love what I do every day and the rest of the day takes care of itself. That's true. 
uh, have some of my customers got behind on paying invoices. Um, Sean, yeah, I mean, we have some customers that are a little bit behind on paying invoices, but they're they're doing good for the most part. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, but, but we definitely have given them a bigger grace period uh, since the whole virus thing and stuff like that. Most of our customers have gone to like from, from 30 day um, net to like 60 day. Um, we had one try to push us to 90, but we said no to that. So, yeah. Um, all right. Well, I, uh, how do I look forward to now? How do I look forward to now? Yeah, I don't know. How do you? I mean, we need to. We need to look forward to now. <laughs> I know that's contradictive, right? It doesn't make sense, but we're, we're always looking forward to the future. No. I mean, we need to live today. That's, that's what I want to do. Now I need to get into that mindset. I need to follow that. I need to do it, but I don't know how, what other state would I consider living in? Oh my gosh, the States that I would consider living in. So, um, I would consider keep on keeping on. That's right. Um, I would consider living anywhere, but California. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. I, I'm a country boy. If I could live in the country, if I could live where there's no neighbors, um, in a nice house, of course, uh, on a plot of land with a lake on it, um, where I could just fish and have fun. But at the same time, my family loves the weather in California. They would not do good in the snow. They would not do good in the cold. They would not do good in consistent rain. Um, my family loves California. And, uh, I mean, there's things about California that I like too. I like the fact that I don't have to go to work when it's and put on a damn snowsuit. My winter is 50 degrees here in California. So, you know, um, but I, I could certainly see myself living in another place with lots of trees, uh, a lake, um, you know, and, and I'd be extremely happy. So, um, but I would, I would, I would not be happy in the fact that I wouldn't have my family with me or they would be miserable. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it's all good. Um, Texas. Yeah. I don't know if I'm a Texas country boy because Texas is hot. Texas is dry. Um, you know, maybe living in a mountain community or something, but nah, I'm not a Texas person. Not really. Um, I'm actually from Missouri. I was actually born in Missouri of all places. Uh, but I moved here when I was really young. So, um, let me see. I I've spent some time as a kid in, in, um, Michigan. And I really liked some of the nice areas in Michigan, uh, the Bloomfield township, uh, very nice, lots of lakes, uh, great weather. I, I know it gets cold and snowy there in the winter time, but the summer times are epic there. So, um, let's see what else. Uh, have I had someone not pay for my work? Yeah, we've had that many times. Definitely had that many, many times where people haven't paid their bills and stuff like that. We've had customers file bankruptcy on us, that kind of stuff for sure. All right, guys. Um, it is time for me to go eat dinner. I am hungry. I really, really appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, if you guys are considering, um, uh, or if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'd really appreciate it guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys on the next one. I'm going to go ahead and end this and uh, I'm going to queue up the outro music. If I can figure out how to do that and do that, I'm going to play this. If y'all could do one thing, if y'all could take one thing from my videos or my live streams, please stop, take a second, take a step back and look at the big picture.
Are you guys going to leave yet? You really shouldn't be here anymore. You guys kind of need to leave. Because, um, yeah. There's, there's not really anything left to talk about. I'm really out of stuff to talk about. So, um, you guys really need to leave. Like, there's still 220 people watching this. What the hell are you guys watching? It just says HVACR videos. There's not even anything going on. Like, you guys need to leave. Go home. Do something. Because, yeah, I'm not coming back on. So, really. it's it. Uh, okay, you're slowly leaving. There's 217 of you now. So you you need to start moving though, like 216. Okay, yeah, but make that move along a little bit faster, guys. So it's time to you know keep going, keep keep that number going down. All right, keep going down. Uh, to see now it's rising. What the hell? There's more people coming back. It lit. I wonder how long I could keep just this stupid screen on with nothing and people just come in here. Like. Okay, there we go. Now we're dropping. 213. Finally, you guys are leaving. There's 213 you now. Keep going. Keep it going down. Come on. All right, for real, I'm ending this because I'm hungry, and I'm out. Peace.